A small limestone cavern in lonely moorland north of Tredega has become known as the Chartist Cave, but no evidence exists for how it came by this name, or indeed what might have gone on there. Accessible only by way of rough tracks, the cave is difficult to find. This can be hazardous country in mist or bad weather. Those charters must have been fit. Quite a long way to come and store weapons, if that's true. Well, I've never believed those claims, Jane, because what an unlikely place to bring materials to make weapons up here, and indeed to store them. It's so far away from everywhere. Well, when you think it would have been a long walk for people carrying materials to make pikes, so I've never believed those claims on there. Were pikes ever made in this cave? Were they ever stored in this cave? I think that's highly unlikely. Something else went on here which gave the cave its name. So they're called the Charters Caves. Why would that be then? Well, we don't know. This is one of the great mysteries of the area, in fact. One of the very mysterious places. I mean, weapons were being stored under Zephaniah Williams' pub in Nanticlo. That is known. Pikes were being made in blacksmith shops around the Ask Valley area. So it's a mystery. One of the most mysterious places in the area. But something was discovered here back in 1970 that puts a light upon Chartism which may or may not be correct. So what's the mystery? What happened in there? Well, it is a mystery because in 1970 a group of cavers from Bristol came here and they dug out that passageway because this cave has never been linked up with a big series that runs under this hillside. And they dug it, the clay in the back and they found the remains of leg bones, of leg bones, actually human leg bones. And they thought, of course, they discovered cave dwellers. But they went to the police pathologist in Cardiff and he said no, he dated them approximately to the Chartist period, around about 1839-ish, that general period. And all those bones had been severed with a hand axe or a butcher's cleaver. In one case, the whole end of the bone had been cut away. So you're left with this strange mystery. Why are there bones in this cave? So I often wonder about this because it seems to me there are three reasons. One is they are of murders, murder victims, which nothing at all to do with Chartism, nothing whatsoever, completely unrelated. Or the second one is, faintly possible, during the attack on Newport, people were mortally wounded, possibly. They, they died when they came back to their homes and to stop recriminations against the families, their bodies were dismembered for easier carriage and brought up here and buried in this general area. The third one is that they could well be the bones of informers. It's known that there were government informers operating in the area, undercover, and they might have been discovered they might have been brought here, they might have been executed here, and it, by some stretch of the imagination, possibly chopped up for burial, scattered over the area. It's, it's an unpleasant thought. If that's the case, if it is true, then it puts a different perspective upon certain aspects of Chartism. I suppose to understand what happened and what is in that cave, or was in that cave, we need to understand more about the area at the time. Yeah, indeed, how right you are, because this was then a wild and a violent and a rough area. It really was. And the possibility of people being murdered is quite likely. I heard that lights were seen coming across the mountains during the time of the Chartists, yeah. called the Chartist Lights. That's perfectly true. It's this sort of place. Yeah, it's, a, it's amazing. They were heading in this direction, so something went on here during the Chartist period. Could it have been secret meetings? Might they have been holding kangaroo courts here? Was this a place of execution? A bit far-fetched possibly, but nevertheless. And were they dismembering bodies to hide them here? But if there were secret meetings here, they were very secret to be held in such a remote and difficult of access place. Uh, if they were holding meetings here, one person who would have been here was Zephaniah Williams, the local leader. He certainly spoke at meetings held at Starfield Tredega. What is now the railway tavern in Sahawi, Ralph, was once Sahawi House in which Daniel Gooch lived. 
So I understand, and uh, what an eminent man he was. To An come incredible from character. Absolutely. He was, started off here at 15 years of age, and very soon afterwards became, I understand, an eminent engineer. He became chairman of the Great Western Railway. He took over chairmanship and the running. He was, in fact, the latter day um, Richard Branson. Yeah, yes. He was an entrepreneur. But it wouldn't it, uh, it doesn't his life here, his experiences here tell something about the violence that was endemic in this oh, area? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, iron towns were notoriously sort of violent and lawless places at this, at this period. And uh, never more so, Peter, when on monthly paydays, the men seemed to have crowded the taverns and very often stayed there until the money ran out. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that uh, criminals came here to seek refuge. Is that because there was no law here? It was a lawless society, essentially lawless. And, uh, but in 1831, you know, Daniel Gooch, later to become a very eminent and respected businessman and entrepreneur, he was seized upon by a group of men uh, from Evervale and Nanty Glow yes. and forced, forced with his friends to march with them to join up with the Merthyr Rioters. From this actual place? From this place, from this area here. Yes. And I understand that he tracked down the road, well, uh, goaded along with sticks, with uh, uh, iron uh, <laughs> spikes. On the end, spikes on the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But later on, not too much, uh, uh, soon afterwards, with the rioters dispersed and defeated, mm -hmm. they came tracking back up Sir Howie Hill, and Gooch and his friends had a revenge. How did they do that? Well, from this, so he said, from this hill here, they pelted them with stones. <laughs> <laughs> so they really were, what, what this does show, although it's not connected with Chartism as such, it does paint a picture of a violent area, a rough and a wild, and almost a lawless area. It was, it was, and for that reason it became known as the land where the bad people lived. Oh. <laughs> and this stone, the famous Sahawi stone, has always intrigued me, Jeff. Is there some sort of history behind this? Yes, uh, it's one of the two marker stones for Sahawi that was put up in 1818. Right. Um, and People like Daniel Gooch, the engineer, would have known of it because he lived nearby. Yes, but actually, the, the stone marks the acquisition by the Harford Ebervale Company of yeah. the Sky Ironworks. Right. And this inevitably led to a lot of bitter divisions between the people of Sahawi and Tridiga. And Harford himself had put the stone up to say it was Sahawi. But the, the people of Tridiga thought it meant success. So inevitably, uh, the, the communities of Sahari and Skulva were divided from the people of Tridiga. Oh, of course, and, of course. And this, this led to a certain amount of hostility because later on, at the time of the uh, Chartist protests in 1839, um, the people of Sahari moved from here over to Sapphire Williams in Nantiglo, which, which is two valleys to the east rather than join the, their friends in Tridiga. So at the time of the protest in November 1839, the people marching to Newport would have passed this stone on the way down to Newport. So actually that stone could tell some stories oh, yes. if only we could tap into it. So this is Starfield, I believe. A very important place in Chartism, I believe. Yes, uh, here one stood the Star Inn, a very important Chartist lodge, and in whose field alongside uh, quite a few important Chartist meetings were held. In August 1839, a large crowd gathered here to support the Sir Howie Declaration presented by John Frost and others as a last attempt for peace, but was in actual fact an attempt to really discredit the moral force arguments. The 
Sir Howe Declaration was actually petitioning the Queen to, and I quote, dismiss her ministry and replace them with wiser and cleverer men and dismiss Parliament. In, even in today's, in today's world, that would be a ridiculous uh, thing to ask. Now, Frost was instructed to deliver this declaration to Home Secretary Russell in London, who he naturally refused to meet him, which was probably the intention. Because now they could argue that the moral argument wasn't going to work and only physically violent action would uh, bring about results. So here in Star Fields, a British Revolution was more or less inevitable. So it's from here, Ivian, that the Sahawi Chartist marched to Nanticlo to join Zephaniah Williams.